The following is an audio excerpt of Chris Hedges and Julian Assange in discussion at the Ecuadorian Embassy in London. For much more, go to truthdig.com. When you watch all these sort of, you know, all this movement, what do you think they're trying to do? How do they want to try and get you out of here? I think it's a mess. I don't think mm. that they have... I think there's so many different parties with different interests. It's a mess. The UK wants it to go away, but doesn't want to lose prestige uh, in relation to Ecuador. Um, the situation in Sweden is getting so bad now that, that Sweden will never offend the US. Neither, country, neither the UK or Sweden will ever offend the US. Um, but within that, uh, the situation is so bad now in Sweden. It's what do you mean so bad? Politically, it's the head of the Swedish yes. Supreme Court came out and said that the case is a mess. Have you had any indication that the Americans have attempted to For the US, manipulate the case in Sweden that is... They don't need to. We have some indications. The ambassador for the UK, Louis Sussman, said beginning of 2011 that they were waiting until after the Swedish case. Um, the independent... Waiting for what? What's the US interest in this situation? It's not the main tradition. No, the he didn't say that, but it's the obvious context. It's the US ambassador to the UK right. said early... 2011. Early right. 2011. That they would... The US was waiting to see what happened with the Swedish case. They wouldn't file at the same time because then there'd be two competing extraditions. Oh, I see. And so I they're see. waiting okay. till I got it. They would if okay. they not, there'd be one in the queue, and yeah. then the other one would come in, and then it would be by the Home Secretary oh. to make a decision, a reviewable court decision, but yeah. a politically reviewable decision to swap the president uh, for these. So what they would do is, if they're going to actually, if they, if Julian had won a non-extradition, they would likely, at that point, in the UK court filed. Yeah. Uh, their extradition. Or they wait to see I go, I go to Sweden. Yeah. So that's what the yeah. ambassador said. And then also the independence diplomatic correspondent said in late 2010 that there were already informal talks between Sweden and the US. The day after, the day after you went into prison? Yeah. Informal talks between Sweden and the US. So you extradite you to Sweden and, and then... And the details were that I think in that he said it was on the conclusion, would be on conclusion of the Swedish, the Swedish case. And then for the US, where I think the political equation is most interesting, you have prosecutors in the Manning case that are clearly gearing up for the 12 week Broadway musical. Yeah. Uh, and where they have their star diva, which is the Navy SEAL guy. Yeah. <laughs> they're going to make him sing. Uh, and it's such a big machine, 141 prosecution witnesses that they're listed. Uh, and the grand jury investigation has been such a big machine, pulling in so many people, so many records, all sorts of court cases about it. That have spun off from Red Epic has a court case in relation to FOIs, which is brought up a lot of interesting information, by the way, about. Do you know Epic at all? No. It's a Washington based NGO called the Electronic Privacy Information Center sort of like ACLU for privacy. Um, and so they, they asked for all FBI and DOJ records about lists of WikiLeaks supporters. They're making an attack under the associative rights. The first amendment of right of association. If there was interference with the potential interference with associative rights. But anyway, in litigating that case, and the way that the FBI and DOJ is defending it, saying we have, well, we have these classes of documents, we can't tell you how many documents in each class, and they're from certain sections, like the section of the DOJ that has to do with expedition. Interesting picture. Anyway, you can see that there's a really very big machine. There's been over a dozen different US departments significantly involved. But that machine is now quite hard to stop insofar as there's budgets already predefined. For example, right. there was a tender put out by the DOJ um, about a year ago for a case management computer system for the WikiLeaks case. The tender was one to two million dollars. 
for that computer system, just to hold the documents. There's all sorts of career interest from prosecutors, FBI, right. etc., in keeping that big thing going. They want to, you know, score. Now, at the level of the senior generals, uh, Eric Holder, actually, let's just go down one. Neil McBride, the, you know, yeah. the, the DA for Massachusetts, has become. No, no, no. Neil McBride, just, you know, it, is the attorney, U.S. attorney for the Eastern District of Virginia. Sorry, Virginia, not Massachusetts. He's the head U.S. attorney guy. He's the guy who's responsible for the national security prosecutions. Uh, and in particular, most of the U.S.'s extraterritorial prosecutions. Uh, there was a hagiographic hey article appeared in the Washington Post about him maybe four months ago. It's really worth reading to understand okay. the geopolitical aspect of the legal part of the case, which I had sort of hadn't realized before, but there's a, a lawfare thing going on with US law to apply US law to as many jurisdictions as possible. And if you have control over, over use of force in a foreign jurisdiction, it's your jurisdiction. It's part of your state, by definition. So he's involved with this project to push to encompass as many states as possible under US law and to bring them back. That article says there's 60 something territories that are building people in and prosecuting them in um, Alexandria, Virginia. He's also handling the Tim.com case. So there's a question as to whether there's a sealed indictment already. If there is a sealed indictment, we believe based on the lots of evidence, both through leaks, but particularly based on the behaviour of the DOJ and Neil McBride in answering questions, that there is a sealed indictment. What does that mean in terms of like... That there is an indictment. Right. But it, and they won't give public notice of it. Why yeah. wouldn't they? Well, because in this case, it, it's the person no. is... Yeah, it's normal. If a person's outside the country, or the person hasn't been arrested hands, yet. I right. don't want to telegraph to that person, you've been indicted. If the person hasn't been arrested yet, it's normal right. that the indictment is sealed. Then by law, it is a criminal offense for any U.S. official aware of the sealed indictment to tell any person, even another U.S. official, of the existence of the sealed indictment, except in the course of executing the warrant. And can you tell me if there have been any public indications that seem to hint that there is a sealed indictment? Under their own rulebook procedure, if you ask, are you a subject, target, or witness for a grand, in a grand jury inquiry, they are meant to tell you. They refuse to do so. You can't go to court on it, but it, their guidelines their say guidelines say this. So if you were to ask, yes. if you were a subject, target, or witness for a grand jury, they would have to tell you. Well, they are meant to. The guidelines are. Guidelines the, the prosecutorial say. guidelines are that they should tell okay. you. Okay, right. They refuse to engage with the question at all. You pose the question to them? They would pose the question. They refuse to engage. Oh, well, that's interesting. It's very suspicious, right? Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. But, but when you say, who should we speak to about it, they go, that guy, that guy. You know, there is a guy that's interesting. that is responsible for asking, answering that question. Right. He refuses to touch it. Why? The easiest explanation is because he would be in breach of right. that law right, that says right. you can't. Do you have any sense as to when that sealed indictment might have come down? There's a, a leak from Stratfor that, whereas internal mail from Stratfor, which is please don't publish, we, there is a sealed indictment against the Sun. Oh, right, I remember that. Yeah. The vice president. I remember that. I remember that. That's he, right. used to work that's at, right. he used to work at Diplomatic Security Service. So right, that's interesting. Yeah. On the other hand, he's a guy who is a bit fast and loose with rumors. So do, you have, do you have any sense of when it might have happened? If there was well, a if it, that email was from 2011. Um, early 2011. Someone has said that maybe the that they had made an indictment and they were just already because if I won the case here, the extradition case, and they needed to move quickly, um, or it's possible that this was a draft indictment that they have or always they have a draft indictment ready to go in case they need it. So maybe the draft indictment was ready, always to go, and then they didn't file it until later on. But what's quite suspicious is that, for sure, the, they have said publicly the investigation is ongoing, that they refuse to follow their procedure and confirm my status, which would be natural if there was a sealed indictment.
The following is an audio excerpt of Chris Hedges and Julian Assange in discussion at the Ecuadorian Embassy in London. For much more, go to truthdig.com. Was there anything in the Manning statement that struck you in particular, surprised you, or...? Everything. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, I think that, uh, we were, that has to be my answer. We were there, and it was so moving. Oh, yeah. oh my we God, it was so moving. It was just broke your heart. It was really... Incredible. Yeah, it really was. And he was so poised. Oh, it was remarkable. It was yeah. really remarkable. Articulate. I thought uh, the mainstream media, you know, the, what do I call it? I have different, very different phrases for this beast. I think I'm this week on the old media. The old media um, portrayal. Of him was to yeah. remove any heroic qualities from yeah, him. Yeah. And a heroic quality is deciding to do something. Yeah. As opposed to it, it being a, an unconscious, unreasoned expression of madness or yeah. sexual frustration or, or whatever. And no one can follow it. You can't follow in anyone's footsteps unless uh, the person you're following has made choices. And you, you might be able, if they've made choices and they've done certain things, then you might be able to choose also to do that. But if you've done things because you're a, a mad homosexual, then no one can choose to be a mad homosexual. Right. Chris and so I they, so they, they stripped him of, yeah. they yeah. attempted to yeah, strip him of all his exactly. refinements. You know, I know exactly. If you could say, look, here's a rare event. Why does a rare event happen? Well, hey, let's, what do we know? Most people weren't able to do this. Uh, let's say whoever this person was, if the argument is that it's Bradley Manning, what do we know about Bradley Manning? We know that he won three science fairs awards. We know the guy is bright. We know that he was interested in politics early on and he was very articulate and, and outspoken and didn't like lies. And we know that he was interested in the state of the world. And we know that he was skilled at his, at his job of being an intelligence analyst. Don't these things suggest that if, if you're going, say, what, for the combination of abilities and motivations that might cause an action, here are talents and virtues that could perceivably give rise to the phenomenon. But instead, people go, they look at all the, you know, it's a homosexual, it's this the answer. Well, 10% 10% of the U.S. military are homosexuals. At least 50% are from broken homes. Okay, if you take those two factors together, that gets you down to, say, 5% explanatory power. There's 5 million people with active security clearances. So you're down to, what, 25? No, you're down to 250,000 people. You've got to get down from 250,000 to 1. <laughs> you know, the easy way to survive in the media is to adopt the dominant stereotype and run with it. And if you challenge the stereotype, I'm just speaking as somebody who's been inside that organization, mm -hmm. you as a reporter are going to catch a lot of shit from your editors, but most importantly from the other reporters who peddle this crap. And so there became, they were very skillfully created, a kind of false persona, obviously completely false. It's this, and it's that this East Coast, it's, I think it's because like Freud got into the East Coast <laughs> of the US and then, <laughs> and then they started working with the sons and daughters of rich people who were disturbed and so then they became a status icon to have a psychiatrist. I mean, how, how absurd is it? How absurd is it in the East Coast of the US where to be a proper person, a proper successful person, as a woman, you have to have a psychiatrist. And as a man, you have to have a lawyer.